Hi everyone, um, welcome to Tough Questions with Monty. Monty's kindly joined me today um, and has offered to um, answer some of the hard questions that, that we might have. Um, for a bit of background, we did a Youth Alpha course um, with the young people before, before Christmas uh, and one of the episodes we, we thought about some of the, the questions we like to ask God and this uh, question we'll look at today was one of the one that, one ones that came up um, quite a bit actually. So Monty, we'll look at the, the issue of suffering, quite a big one to start with. Um, so thanks for jumping in uh, with that. Um, yeah. But uh, how are you feeling? Did you do a bit of prep on that one? Well, I mean, it's always been a massive question, something that Christians, uh, philosophers, have dealt with for, for centuries. Um, I, I sometimes smile when people think that they've sort of got me on, on, you know, proving God or disproving God and saying, ah, well, what about suffering? As if it's something that Christians aren't aware of, as if we've never had to face this or never had to answer this before. It's been something that's been right there, right back in the Bible itself, in the book of Job. Um, and, you know, when you look at how God's people have suffered in the Bible and then persecution, if anybody knows about suffering, I think Christians know about it, especially if you think, look around Christians in the world today who are being persecuted for their faith. Um, we know all about it. Uh, so it's it's not a new question. Yeah, I, I suppose as we, that's, that's really helpful. Um, I suppose the accusation might be is that, that as Christians, um, we can talk of suffering quite an abstract way or, or uh, but, but sort of digging deep and suffering's real. Um, you know, folks watching this video, folks everywhere, especially at the minute, but not just at any time, um, are experiencing suffering. We, we, we can turn on the news and we see it. Like, it's, this isn't just a, a sort of simply an apologetic question, but it, it is something that we're really facing. Like, I suppose the accusation might be thrown at, is it just, do Christians bury their head in the sand? Do we, you know, is it just a bit of a, a got a bit of a crutch to make us kind of get rid of suffering in, in our mind? Yeah, it's like sort of escapism, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you're right. There are two sides to this, and it depends where we are. If I'm talking about it, I want to know where people are. For some, it's an intellectual question, and it's a very real intellectual question. You know, if God is good, then why is there suffering? And when things are going okay in your life, you can afford the luxury of sitting and thinking about that, and we can talk about that, and we can give answers to that. But then there's the personal side, the intellectual, but there's also the personal side when it hits you, when somebody you know and love dies or falls sick, uh, or you yourself are, are in pain in some way and really feeling hurt or um, in, in, in some way ill, uh, that, that, that then it's a different sort of thing and we need to we may approach it differently. I mean, it doesn't change our answer, but we just approach it differently. But I, I would say to those who say that Christianity is an escapism or it's not really facing up to the reality, well, what I said before, Christians do, do suffer and do know all about this and have done always. I would also say that it's, it's probably more accurate to say that those who ignore God or discount God, um, who don't believe, are actually the real escapists because they're not facing up to the reality of what this world and universe would be like without God. So the alternative then, what is the alternative? The alternative is that, to the famous quote from Richard Dawkins, the, the atheist, which is that all we are left with is blind, pitiless indifference, that there is no meaning to the universe. Um, and I think most people, there are very few consistent atheists like Dawkins and I, I, I think even even some agnostics are distancing themselves from Dawkins because they see where that leads they see to the what's what we call nihilism the nothingness that that leads to and they sort of backtracked a little bit from that because there are very very few consistent atheists most people are inconsistent atheists that is that they'll say we don't really think about God we don't believe in him but then sometimes when they're in trouble they'll pray They'll say, well, I do believe in some sort of higher being. They, they cannot face the reality of life without God. So in some ways, they are the real escapists, escaping the natural um, end of their own arguments, they, the natural conclusion of their atheism. They can't face up to that because without God, um, you're right, there is no meaning. And as one interviewer asked Dawkins, what do you say to the mother whose nine-year-old has... A terminal illness 
Um, and and uh, Dawkins says, well, I, I, I just have to say there is no meaning to that. And the interviewer said, well, that's not very satisfactory uh, for the mother. And then the interviewer, and then Dawkins says, well, it's not about being satisfactory. That's just the way it is. And I think in our heart, we all know that that's not right, that we have been made with this God-shaped hole in our lives, that we know there is something else and something beyond. So I would say that they are the real escapists. And if I'm faced with an atheist and they say, you know, what about the problem of suffering? I, I, I fire it back and I say, well, what's your answer to suffering? Because you've, I've got a problem with it. You've got a problem with it. We've both got a problem with it. The question is, do you have any hope? Uh, you know, the question is, who has the hope? Who, who actually can look beyond the problem and see that there might be a solution? Yeah, that, that's really helpful. Actually, that even that sort of practical advice of, of asking questions back to the people who are talking about this, that's, that's great. Um, can you help us a bit with, so you may be touching already, you know, God is good and he's also powerful. So, you know, the, the logical step in my mind is if, if God is 100% good and he's 100% powerful then why is it not 100 percent perfect if that makes sense why um why are things perfect you know why is the world the way it is <laughs> yeah um yes again that's 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 the, the dilemma god could put an end to evil um you know in, in whatever way he wants the trouble is if he did if he right now put an end to all evil it wouldn't be really good news for us because we are all imperfect uh, and the question is that if we decide where God draws the line, we're, we're going to be in a, in a, an unholy mess because I might say, well, well, you know, wh who should God judge? You know, who should he get rid of? Well, you know, the really evil people, uh, you know, the rapists and murderers and all of that. Um, and then you start going down, well, what about, you know, people who uh, are don't, they don't they don't murder anybody they maybe abuse their partners or their kids or whatever and suddenly you're thinking well where do we draw the line and most people will draw the line somewhere beyond them they'll be okay but a lot of other people won't be and the issue is that the bible tells us that we are all sinful that we are all uh, deserving of god's judgment because when we're honest you know we're jealous we're lustful we're proud we're angry unnecessarily, um, we're selfish. Um, and it may be an issue of degree, but it's all the seeds of it are all there in our own hearts. So if God really has to eradicate every sort of bit of evil in the world, then we're going to be under the judgment. Uh, and so in his mercy and his grace, he has decided not to put an end to evil immediately. And one of the reasons that the Bible gives for that is that he's giving all of us a time to turn to him and to understand that only in him do we have hope for the end of suffering, that the Bible finishes with a picture where there's going to be no more tears, where there's going to be no more illness, no more suffering. And if we want to be part of that, then God has given us time. God has given us today and tomorrow to turn to him so that we can claim our part in that new kingdom where there's going to be no more suffering or evil. Um, and I think that's, that's very important to say. Uh, um, I think it's Tim Keller says that uh, on the cross, which is where, where I want to, I guess I want to end up, um, uh, this question anyway, uh, is that on the cross, God found a way of putting an end to evil without putting an end to us. And what he did was he actually took it on himself. Uh, so in Jesus Christ on the cross, God himself took all the evil, took the darkness. You know, we think of all the injustice. If you read the story of Jesus' life, all the injustice, this perfect person. Uh, and there's no doubt that he was. I mean, if, if anybody was circulating a story about somebody being perfect and sinless, and they weren't, it wouldn't take long to discredit that. I mean, if somebody wrote a book about me being perfect, it wouldn't take long to discredit that. In front of the queue would be Gwen, my wife, saying that that's <laughs> not true. Um, but, but Jesus, who lived this perfect life, was unjustly treated, betrayed, falsely accused, and then went through agonizing death. Uh, and the Bible says that that was all so that there would be a way for each of us to be part of that new painless, sufferingless 
kingdom uh, because God would forgive us in Christ if we turn to him. So that's our hope. We've still got a problem when we're in the middle of it, but we do have hope because God has taken the problem onto himself and has dealt with it there. Great news, great news. Uh, you, you just, just as we wrap up, you touched there that we've still got a problem we're in the middle of it, and I suppose it goes back full circle to what we uh, what you said at the start about there being a real personal um, aside to this. So, you know, obviously we're in the middle of a pandemic, and actually that is causing suffering for so many people. And actually, um, but there all there may also be situations that people are in where actually the pandemic seems trivial, where they're going through real hurt and um, they've lost loved ones, or that there's something even more. Uh, they're, they're going through something that um, they're really feeling the pain at the minute that they're hurting. How, give us some, some wisdom on that. How do you deal with that? I mean, when I'm listening to somebody, maybe, you know, when I was sitting with people who were bereaved and or had, had encountered some really unjust suffering, I used to say, I guess I said three things. One is, this happens in a broken world that it's, it's something which is part of living in a selfish and broken world, that uh, this side of, of heaven, we're all gonna suffer. I mean, again, I came across people who said, well, I stopped believing in God, or I stopped believing in Jesus, you know, when my granny died. And I said, well, I'm sure that was a terribly traumatic time for you, but if you only stopped believing in God when that happened, but you didn't believe, stop believing in him when there were hundreds of people dying all over the world every day, then mm -hmm. your initial faith was very self-centered. So these things happen. Um, and when they hit us, the power of that is very strong. And um, it's part of it is to hold on to the fact that this world is not perfect. And, and the second thing to say is it's not fair. So to, 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 to walk with the person and say, listen, I understand this is not fair. This should not be happening. You should not be suffering this. And the way that God planned for this world, um, you know, sometimes it's a result of other people's sin. You know, somebody I know whose kid was killed by a drunken driver. It could be natural disaster. It could be a virus. It could be a plague, whatever. Uh, you're saying, listen, this is not fair. This is not the way it was meant to be. So it happens, but it's not fair. But then the third important thing is it's not the whole story. It's not the end. And I think that's when we get back to what I said earlier. Do we have hope? Um, another colleague of mine from Wales uh, was talking and he said that the one thing that brought his neighbour to faith in Jesus was how he and his wife coped with the loss of their child. Because this neighbour also had loads of problems, but he looked at my friend and he said, you know, you're, you're going, you're walking through, yeah, you're crying, it, it's awful, but, but you seem to be walking through this a different way than I would be. And so Christians, far from being escapists, face the problem head on. And in the strength of God, who, who says, I will walk through the valley of the shadow of death with you, um, they have somebody who actually does understand if we're walking with them we can never understand you know i've walked with people and i say i listen i i don't understand I've, i i will i've never been in that position i don't understand who you are but i know somebody who does and i'm going to be praying that god walks with us through this in jesus christ because he knows what it was like to lose a child he knows what it was like to be um betrayed he knows what it was like to be unjustly treated he suffered the way anybody would suffer uh, and that's the wonderful thing about being a Christian. It's a wonderful thing about the gospel of Jesus Christ that no other philosophy, no other uh, religion, no other um, un way of understanding our world can give you a God who got involved himself and took on the suffering and the pain. And in some ways, rather than being a big apologetic answer, against Christianity. It can be one of the biggest things for Christianity that Christians acknowledge this, accept it, but recognize that they have hope. Uh, and because of Christ, he walks with them through it. I, I, that's all you can say. Brilliant, brilliant. Monty, thanks so much. I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, that's, been, that's been really helpful. So um, Glad uh, thanks to you. Yeah, and to all the teenagers who are listening, um, 
these are questions I had. These are questions that I used to talk with my friends about. And in God's grace, by really getting down and reading what the, the, the Bible, New Testament particularly said about this, um, I, I came to this strong belief that this is our only hope. Great. Molly, I don't want to put words in your mouth here, but, but uh, I think, is it okay to say that if, if you have any other questions, either off the back of this or other sort of big questions, that Monday would be happy to, to do another episode of Molly Stuff oh, Questions? Yeah, totally. Absolutely. Yeah. Go for it. Great. Well, thank here, you. ask away. Then, and, um, thank you very much. Good to see you. Cheers.